can you deliver maybe one week before we end the semester and this is just training for you to the final exam but for you this uh, compulsory exercise will have a weight of 40% of the final grade. So you have one part of the final grade, 40%, when you meet in the final exam. And that's good for you. Okay, back to the text for today. And this transaction costs and the problem with information, trust, and transaction uh, cost as a part of minimizing costs. Over to the next topic. That is the structure of a modern firm. And for the time being, the trend is definitely to organize a company as a corporation because of limited liability. With a corporation, you just share risk with the rest of the stockholders and you have only liability for that part of the total uh, shareholder stock that is your responsibility and proprietorships and partnerships the problem there is unlimited liability and if you plan to start a new company think properly through if you start as a proprietorship very often very soon you will have to guarantee with your own ownership in your house and if that company will get bankruptcy, you will lose your house. Therefore, cooperation with limited liability is definitely the trend. And you can read a lot of this in the text, but I don't teach too much over that text. Just conclude that the trend is cooperation with limited liability as the main structure of a modern firm. But what is the problem with a corporation? The problem is that you split the owner and the control because the manager will have control and the owner will only be responsible to find the directors to be in the board of directors and since very often the manager as you can read from the textbook will be involved in that process you might easily end up in a manager that might have control over the board. And that might be a problem. With a manager with too much control, then the owners might end up with a firm that don't maximize profit. Because definitely for the owner to maximize profit is exactly 
the same as in the long run to maximize the value of the company and as an owner you want that value to be as high as possible and if you have a manager that ends up with another incentive system you might end up in a market where for a short while the manager can maximize sales instead of profit what can be the consequences of maximizing sales I remember in Norway when we deregulated the financial system that took place in 1981 and that deregulation started with players that tried to maximize sales they tried to capture steal from the other banks as many customers as possible and too many of the banks came out with financial papers with no guarantees at all and when the economy went into trouble what happened in Norway was a financial crisis in 1988 so we had the financial crisis from 88 to 92 that is the main reason why maybe when the financial crisis came up in 2008 we were prepared for that because we already had the experience when we deregulated the financial system and during that period all the employees in the banks they tried to capture the, the customers for whatever price and they tried to maximize sales and that ended up in a financial crisis but in the long run that cannot exist as an incentive system because if you just maximize sales somebody out there will understand that that is not survival of the fittest <laughs> because the only way to survive in the long run if you will have competition is to maximize profit but in the short run you can maximize sales and what's said in the textbook is that all the managers they have a kind of utility function and they try to maximize their own utility function and it's not always the same as maximizing profit for instance some directors might prefer a very nice office and might prefer to have his own airplane his own car with a chauffeur and through that kind of luxury if that's a part of the utility system for the manager it might be that the board of directors will not be able to have enough information to understand deeply what's going on you can always argue in the board I need this nice office because all my customers they like very much the expensive paintings on the walls and I need this airplane because I travel so much and then it is for them to prove that there will be more cost-efficient solutions 
and the managers might now and then be much better to find information good enough to convince the board of directors that he needs it. That is a part of the utility system. And as you will all know, because that also counts for students, some managers are nasty. <laughs> they, want, they don't work that hard. Some like to be lazy. Some like to work very hard. And if that manager director will feel that, that my job is safe, I am very good to convince the board that I really work hard. And if you don't, again, it's difficult for the board to find out where he is. <laughs> he is out fishing salmon, or is he out there discussing with his customers? And he could say, I met my customers uh, along the river side, <laughs> but that might be a hobby. And therefore, also the concept X in efficiency will appear as an important topic within the text for a modern firm that you cannot always guarantee that they maximize profit. And if they don't, they can survive for a while with that X in efficiency, but only for a while. Why is it difficult to survive? First of all, that is the last bullet point. In the long run, if all the players out there will understand that the only way to survive is to maximize profit. The only players that don't and that play X inefficiency, that player will not survive and through competition, the managers will have incentives to maximize profit just as a mean to survive. And now and then, the textbook will tell us that there is another mechanism that also can threaten the manager. And that is that even though there is a coalition between the manager and the board, there are players out there that will follow the company and through information about the company, they might see that this company can be much more efficient if we just will have a new manager that will act according to profit maximization. There are players out there that play takeover strategy. In Norway, we have a very famous one that was a man from Malta, Kjelling Rikke. He came home from Alaska, where he was a fisherman, very successful. He earned a lot of money. And with this money, he just started in Norway a takeover strategy. And now he's a very big player within the petroleum sector. And a very important business leader in Norway. But he started his game with a takeover strategy. And always with a takeover strategy, the players will sack <coughs> the managers and find a new manager 
and new leaders and develop a new culture that will be to play profit maximization. And the new leaders will be forced through that takeover strategy to play profit maximization. So now and then we'll see out there when we start to play game theory that they don't always profit maximize. In a period, they can have a different strategy. No, and then it can be to deviate from profit maximization in the short run, to increase income in the long run, and in discounted value, it can still be profit maximization to deviate in the short run. That is the kind of game we will play later on. But so far, we assume that in most cases we are going to deal with. The incentive system is so strong out there that even though a modern firm is very complicated. There are so many players within a company that the manager will have the negotiation with the employee. There is a financial division. There is a division for marketing. There is a division for production. There is a division for R&D. There is a division for environmental issues. And the head of the companies will have to play internally when that complex system of a complex modern firm with many divisions, and each of them will have their own incentives. For instance, in one of the chapters where we deal with R&D, innovation and R&D, if you are a proper researcher within a company, do you think that researcher has any incentive to maximize profit if you are a proper researcher? If you are a proper researcher, you just look for new information, you look for a solution to a problem, and that problem is for a researcher so important, he, she will be so involved that it is the problem that will drive the researcher for a solution and not profit. So every time when the innovation di division or the research, the R&D division will negotiate with the top manager, the argument will be we need more money to do more research. In the long run, we will earn money. But in the long run, we'll all be dead. <laughs> and the manager will definitely try to tell the R&D division that um, are you sure that you will end up in a project where the company will earn money? And this is the field where I do my research. And I've done that for 25 years. That incentive system within the companies that deals with R&D, new information, and the 
long run profit from our NT project. And the researchers <coughs> have always their own incentive system. And I remember <coughs> when I first did an evaluation <coughs> with a college from Cambridge, that is as long as ago as 1991, <coughs> we traveled all over Norway and interviewed companies to understand what's really going on. And I learned from my colleague in Cambridge, because he had just left the university for a while, because he did the report that is a very famous one that was called the Cambridge Phenomenon, where they tried to understand why is that community so successful from spin-offs from Cambridge University. Why did, did that start so early in Cambridge? Why has it been that successful? And why don't we see as many successful universities other places? The Cambridge phenomenon. And I learned from him how to interview the companies to understand this very complex world going on within the company and it's so important for the company to survive. If you don't have a good strategy within R&D and innovation, in a modern economy, you will not survive in the long run. And the research division have their own incentives. And the head of the company, the managers, they will have to fight them tell them over and over again that we are a company where we maximize profit, but the incentive system for the researchers can never be enough. If you are a proper researcher, just think, I call myself a researcher. If you are a proper researcher, my teacher told me, and I had my first teacher, I was an assistant for a professor at the University of Oslo that won the Nobel Prize in Economics. I started for him in 1975. <laughs> and his story was, as a researcher, you must never, never, ever think about the results. What? Never think about the results. The driving force must always be to look for new information. And that story is always told in the research system. And the manager just will have to live with that. That makes the decision internally a very complex communication system with different incentives and where you need in a game theoretic approach to understand the incentive system. But so far, even though we know from this course that it is really complex, the competition and survival of the fittest is so important, important within a company that the winner in the long run is the manager with the main objective to maximize profit. That is the understanding so far. The complex modern firm and <coughs> I think that um, this innovation chapter 
this R and D chapter for this course will be important and I will probably use more time for you as students as I've done for any other students because this is a part of business strategy that is growing in importance and no other courses deals with that in in this uh, master course that was the contract so far next picture this is the easy one mm. but it's the brilliant one how to decide how much to produce and the easy way out of this topic is that you always decide to produce exactly that quantity where one extra unit produced will exactly give a moderate revenue equal to moderate cost why come? Because if you produce a too low quantity, you might end up in marginal revenue being higher than marginal cost. And since you maximize profit, what to do? You produce one unit extra because the marginal revenue will exceed the marginal cost. Then you see again that still, if I produce one more unit, marginal revenue is higher than the marginal cost. And I go on until that gap will be, will disappear, where you exactly ends up to reduce the quantity where at the margin, the margin revenue that you earn producing one extra unit will be equal to the margin cost. And if you reduce too much, it's quite the opposite process. If you are rational, if you produce so much and you see that at the margin, the margin revenue is lower than the marginal cost, you say to yourself, that could not be optimum. Then, to increase your income, you reduce that with one unit, where still the marginal revenue will be lower than the marginal cost. At the margin, you still lose money you don't like that or your board follow you as a manager tell you that we don't want you to reduce too much we know you don't at the margin earn enough at the last unit you produce are you a manager that maximizes sales and if you are I'll sack you Then you go on reducing until the board will say, can you show me exactly at the margin, at the level we produce now, what is the marginal revenue, what is the marginal cost, and you tell them, and you will have the board directors nodding. Now we are satisfied, you can keep the job. And I remember from one interview with a company in Norway, the incentive problem with the manager and the researchers might often be the real problem. Because we came to an R&D company that didn't earn money. We interviewed them and we saw why. All the researchers had been responsible for this 
company to enter the market and to expand. So the researchers, they were more or less the bosses within the company. And the financial division, the market division, they just kept quiet. And we interviewed them, and we just saw the problem. And my, my colleague from Cambridge was not always very polite. So in Norway, we don't say that. But during the interview with the researchers, with the managers, because of the incentive problems, he just said, sack the researchers. The manager said, what did you say? <laughs> sack the researchers. And he asked, why come? They don't earn money anymore. They did, but not anymore. You don't need so many anymore. You need two, three, but not that many. And then, it's not easy to sack the researchers. Huh. So finally, in this nice profit maximization picture, this is the easy way out of big problems. Huh. It is just to conclude that marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. And maximizing the revenue function, profit gives price equal to marginal cost. If on the perfect competition, you are price taken. This is simple microeconomics, but we just need to repeat that. Next one. What about con cost concept? In our perspective, <coughs> We are going to deal with economic costs, not accounting costs. And by economic costs, we mean opportunity costs. Concerning the labor force, and we can conclude that the accounting cost and the opp opportunity cost is equal for that part of the labor force where you, where you pay salaries because the alternative cost is the wage that the labor force will earn in the best alternative usage. Why? Very often, the companies don't take into consideration the time used by <coughs> the leaders in the company. But the opportunity cost here is exactly the same. How much the leaders can earn in the best alternative usage of their competence. If you just can let somebody hire them, the alternative cost will be the willingness to pay in the marketplace for hiring your manager on part-time. You always think in this course, in the, in <coughs> the concept of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is not that easy to understand. But here, economic cost is the best alternative use of an input 
and that is called opportunity cost and every company out there that will compete to survive they should never never consider the accounting costs because survival in the long run is to understand economic costs and opportunity costs that is the survival strategy you can just fix the accounting system and gev get that whatever numbers you want that is not too difficult but you can never fool the marketplace and the opportunity cost will be decided in the marketplace which the accounting costs will not and it is the marketplace that is our concepts for all cost analysis then we have just to go through basics concerning the different cost concepts you know what is meant with fixed cost and variable costs variable costs will vary with output if you expand increase output the variable costs will increase fixed costs will not so in the short run there is a dis distinction between the variable costs and the fixed costs that is important but just as important at that distinction is to understand sunk cost because sunk cost is that part of fixed cost that is not recoverable and will not influence your behavior and when we later on will play you have to understand the distinction between the recoverable costs and the not recoverable costs because the cost that can be recovered will always be a part of your strategy that will be a part of your strategy just in the short run as the variable cost will be so you are a player when you play over fixed cost that is recoverable but you don't play over that part that sunk cost sunk is sunk for example for example the exact uh, problem I deal with now in an expert group because that came up in my head we have a problem that Norway pay a lot of money <coughs> into <coughs> a research fund in EU that's a common research system and we just pay an amount and then the researchers will go out there to compete getting some back and when you are a proper economist once you have paid that some cost and yeah but what about the benefit uh, which Norway get from, it, from that research can you prove for me that the benefits there will be higher than what you benefit collaborating with the, with the university in Harvard in US then you will have to prove that the benefit will be higher in Europe than in US so my point is just to pinpoint in that export committee and I'm going to have to have that meeting on Thursday 
and if they know what me, I don't think they do. Hmm. My colleagues, because we are a professor group online, uh, and when I say that this is some cost, okay, you know, and then it's just either we win contracts in US or we win contracts in Europe. We'll collaborate us from France or England or, or Germany. Nobody can prove for me that that will be give us a benefit higher than collaborating with a team from US, from Australia, or from China, or from Belarus, or from Africa. So in my head, we pay there, some cost, and we compete. And as for me, as a researcher, it's just as important to win the contract with a colleague in China, US, as to win it with a colleague in Europe. That's my point. Once we have failed, then some cost. And what we get back, if we get back something from US, that's money, just as it's money we get back from collaborating with re researchers in Europe, money is money. <laughs> <laughs> some cost is where we have no incentives to change behavior because it's sunk. So you don't play over sunk cost. That might sound a little bit strange, but just think it over. <laughs> you don't play over sunk cost because they are not recoverable. But if somebody will tell me that all the expert committee that are going to select the winners that will apply for contracts in that EU system. And they tell me that since you're from Norway <laughs> and since you're stupid, we will just help you to win the competition because you don't win if you compete on equal terms. If they say that since you have paid so much, will help you to win. Okay, if somebody tells me that, that's corruption. <laughs> so that's not allowed. That's not allowed. So you compete where you compete where you compete. Win contracts, go out there, do research. If you're winning a company, go out there, win the contracts. Either the partners will be within Europe, within Eastern Europe, within the uh, US system, within Brazil, is a very nice country for collaborating research. Brazil is a nice one, or Africa, because we have a lot of uh, collaboration going on with Africa concerning the petroleum sector. <laughs> so with EU, they don't do so much. They have not that much activity within petroleum. Maybe I will say, we will have to go to Africa. <laughs> because there is not that much left on the continental shelf around England, around uh, Netherlands. And the new discoveries now will to a great extent be in Africa, in Brazil, in um, US, and maybe they are more attractive. Maybe. That was just the example of opportunity cost, fixed cost, and sunk cost. You are still here. <laughs> So we have one more break and only one <coughs> more part before it's weekend. So break. <laughs>